So welcome to the, the first of the 2023 uh, Living with Disability Research Centre uh, seminars, which are online. And we're going to follow the same format as we've followed for the last uh, two years now. Um, the seminars, we have, each seminar will have two speakers and there'll be an opportunity for questions after each speaker. If you want to ask a question, you need to put it in the Q and A, um, and we'll we'll uh, moderate the questions after the speakers have finished. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Teresa, who's <laughs> who's going to introduce the first speaker. Over to you, Teresa. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm Teresa Ricano, a member of the Living with Disability Research Centre, and. It's my job to present the person who does, needs no introduction, uh, Professor Chris Bigby, the Director of LIDS, and uh, she's presenting some work she's done for the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission, Conundrums of Group Homes. Over to you, Chris. Okay, thanks very much, Teresa. I should say this, this um, I didn't do all of this work for the uh, for the Safeguarding Commission, what I what I want to do today is to try and review some of the concerns that have been raised since that report was launched, and talk about some of the concerns about the potential of group group homes to deliver good quality a good quality of life, and then to just do a review really of uh, the findings from the literature that I that I reviewed for the Safeguarding Commission. Um, in the report that's entitled Evidence About Best Practice in Supported Accommodation Services, what needs to be in place. And that formed part of the own motion inquiry that the Commission undertook that was launched in the middle of January. Um, and then just very briefly touch on some of the new challenges um, that were identified both in that report and in my literature review um, in terms of coordination and collaboration um, that opposed for that opposed for service providers involved in providing support to people in group homes, and then just touch on the sort of recommendations that the uh, commission made in terms of potential the development of new standards uh, for support for people in group homes. So, I guess unlike uh, much of what we normally present, I just want to run through some of the critique of group homes that has come through very loud and clear in, in the media, uh, from the advocates, in the commentary around the Royal Commission hearings, um, rather than any hard evidence about group homes. And people will probably be familiar with some of this material. There's a suggestion that group homes as a model of service aren't aligned with Australia's commitment to the rights of people with disabilities under the CPRD. And that it's now, an outmoded model of service, that it can be seen as being segregated, that they're closed environments quite often, that people are congregated together, and that in many ways, group homes reflect institutional environments. Um, I don't want to comment on that particularly, but there is literature that argues against them being institutional environments if you take the traditional notion of an institution. Um, but there's a strong feeling coming from the advocacy sector that group homes should be phased out. And also that they're, they've been the only choice available for people for a long time. Um, and for many people that are living in group homes, they're the only experience that they've known. So it's very difficult, even in the current context where choice and control um, is given a lot of, of, of credence for people to make choice about other options because they've had no, no experience of living in other options other than their family home or an institution. And the argument is that if there was adequate support for people to consider other options and maybe even experiencing them, then many people would opt to move. And the other interesting argument that was put forward at the Royal Commission a couple of weeks ago was that actually the group home model is an unacceptable model for the future generations of people with a disability who haven't had any experience of, of institutions, who will have much higher expectations about choice and control, about the nature of their home and about changes of their home throughout their life course. Um, 
So all of that sort of put together tends to indicate that there's a sort of strong feeling, and it's a feeling based on, on a rights ideology, that it's a flawed model. I am not an apologist for this model, and I don't want to appear to be, and I think those many of those critiques are very valid, particularly when you look at some of the, um, the incidents of, of abuse and poor treatment and poor quality service that goes on in group homes. But I think we need to consider quite carefully then what might replace group homes um, and what about the here and now for the people that are living in group homes? What about their quality of life? And I don't think we can afford to forget that. So when you think about the alternatives, there's a lot happening. Um, there's a growth of innovative models um, and that's in brackets because some of them aren't so innovative. Some of them have been around for quite a long time, but they've been being relabeled re as innovative. So there's single living apartments, um, there's which where people can live on their own, but can have some shared support as well. There's the new NDIS ILO model, which attempts to blend informal and formal support together for people to either live on their own or with one or two other people. Across the country, group homes are being reconfigured um, into smaller shared living arrangements and new building and renovations are happening. And, and that's been happening for quite a long time. And there's a growing model about having social housing or other forms of rental for people and then having drop-in support. And really that's much more available in terms of the drop-in support than it's ever been before because of the funding from the NDIS. So quite a few people are moving out of group homes um, and people aren't necessarily moving into them in the same numbers that they were before. But it's not happening particularly fast uh, and it's predominantly but not always uh, people with acquired disabilities who are moving into uh, particularly the single apartment living and some of the newer models. Although the ILOs are, um, I think more people with intellectual disabilities are moving into those. But the problem is from a researcher's point of view, the figures are really hazy. Um, SDA is a sort of generic term that's now used. Uh, SIL funding doesn't necessarily match SDA funding, um, and it's not always clear uh, in either the data that comes out or in the discussions what option is actually being talked about and, and which group is being talked about too. So today I want to make it really clear that I'm focusing on people with intellectual disabilities who are the predominant group who live in, in group homes. Um, obviously, there are many other groups of people that need alternative supported accommodation um, and there's people moving out of nursing homes people get stuck in hospital and those people with acquired disabilities are, are the, often the people that are moving into some of these uh, new models and the single developments particularly that the summer foundation um, has been working so hard on um, but there's major challenges uh, particularly in the in the new models around using social housing and rental um, about attracting investors to invest in new housing stock and the issue of rental affordability, which seems to be uh, getting worse. So the onus is on state governments to invest in, in social housing. People would have heard me say this before, but housing models are important and we tend to just talk about housing models, uh, the bricks and mortar, but they're they're necessary, you need somewhere to live, but for people with intellectual disabilities, they're not sufficient on their own. It's not enough just to have somewhere to live, you need the support that goes with it. And there's many anecdotal assertions that the new models are better than the group home model. There's evidence about the outcomes from new models, which is quite promising, but it's very scant and it's very small scale. So there's some very positive results from some of the work that the Summer Foundation has been doing, led by Jacinta Douglas, um, about new build SDA, predominantly for people with neurological disability. And the evidence shows that there's significant improvements in people's well-being when they move into new SDA. 
But the question is, from where? And many of those people are moving from hospitals or from, from aged care. Um, they're, not, they're not necessarily moving from group homes or from their family home. Um, but that And that work is going to expand over the next few years with a recent linkage grant to really look at the people moving into new build SDA and the, the change that happens for them because of both the building and the support. The studies of people with intellectual disabilities who get um, drop-in support show very mixed outcomes and show that there's very few differences actually between outcomes for people in group homes and people who have different types of accommodation support. What they do show, or they tend to show, is that there's increased choice and in some regards increased community participation. But a study we did in Australia in 2017 showed that people living in group homes, when they were matched to people that were living with drop-in support, both groups had a fairly mediocre quality of life and that there were significant gaps in the quality of support, for, um, particularly in terms of people's health and people's interpersonal relationships. So people living in some of the newer models were, were, were lonely and were experiencing quite difficulties managing health conditions. There is a number of studies in progress and we're involved in one of them, which is looking at some of the uh, new individualized options for people. Um, and what that data is beginning to show is that they require inordinate amounts of time from family and other informal supporters to make them work. And at times the quality of support that's provided to people is unreliable and fairly poor quality. And I would argue that part of the reason for that is that very little attention has been given to the quality of support um, because we've been focused on housing models and assume that the support will just take care of itself. But the quality of support is really critical um, for any housing and support model for people with intellectual disabilities. So if we turn back to group homes, um, one of the things that's really clear is that we seldom hear from the people themselves. Um, and part of the reason for that is obviously that people with more severe and profound intellectual disabilities uh, are more likely to live in group homes. And those are the people that find it really difficult to express their views. And that's why most of the research in this area has been has used observation. But there's been no systematic attempt to really explore the preferences or to provide supported decision making um, for people who, to, to look at other alternatives who are living in group homes. And I think this is a, is a major gap that needs to be addressed. And, and it's clear you can't just ask people, you need to get to know people and you need to give people different experiences. It was very interesting a couple of weeks ago, Urella had done a survey of people um, asking them about whether they wanted to move from a group home and about half of the people that responded uh, said they did want to move. And my apologies if I haven't quite got that right. Um, but, but a significant group did want to move. But in contrast, if you read the Quality and Safeguarding Commission's re own inquiry report um, and the consultations that they commissioned uh, from uh, Valid and a couple of other um, organisations of people with intellectual disability, they also indicated that some people are quite satisfied and quite happy living in group homes. So from what we can tell, um, you know, some people are quite happy to stay in group homes with the proviso that they really don't have a lot of experience of anything else. So I think my position is that we need to use what, I, what one of my PhD students coined as both and thinking. So we need to think both about new options, but also the here and now. How can we make group homes as good as they can be for the people that are still there? And so I want to turn now to looking at what we know about best practice and the quality of support in group homes. What we know from, from a, a lot of experience, a lot of research is that there's huge variability in outcomes for people that live in group homes. Again, pointing to the fact it's not the model, it's the quality of support, um, and that good outcomes are possible. And that practice is the most significant uh, thing that makes the difference in terms of the outcomes for people. So we've been doing a longitudinal study now since 2011 of 
the quality of support in group homes. And this is just some very high level data to show, I guess, what's possible and the changes over time. So you'll see, I've given the numbers of organizations that have been involved in the study, 2011, six, 2018, it was 11, 2022, it was 12, and there's, there's about 16 uh, at this point in time now. And you can see the number of group homes involved uh, and the number of people. So the data set has grown and got more rigorous over time. But what we can see is that the mean percentage of time that people living in group homes in our study has increased over time. The mean percentage of time that people are engaged in some form of meaningful activity or social interaction has increased from 51% of the time to 63% of the time in 2022. And that shows that there is potential to have a significant increase in the level of engagement of people, and thus a, a, de a decrease in their levels of disengagement. Disengagement means actually doing nothing. And that's what is often the trigger for challenging behavior, um, self-injury, uh, and other very negative outcomes for people. And the last figure is the quality of active support, which is the quality of support and the measure on the active support measure, which has grown from 39% to 62% in 2018. And then if you see, there's a dip in the latest figures, which goes back to 52%. Um, our, the reason for that, I think, is very clear in that the whole of the disability sector was, was disrupted by COVID and there are enormous workforce issues. So when we collected this data, it was very close to COVID. It was in between lockdowns and it was in a period of time when there was acute shortage and turnover of staff. But what we're seeing, even though engagement is increasing, that engagement is often uh, passive rather than, than active. So people are spending more time engaged, but that engagement is often uh, watching videos um, and using iPads and things like that now. And the data on the, the far side of this uh, table shows that people below 151 on the ABS, which is people with more severe and profound disabilities, still consistently have lower levels of engagement and receive poorer support compared to people that are more able. So if you look, the people below 151 in our recent figures are still only scoring 42% uh, on the quality of support that they receive compared to the people who are more able, who lead, need less support, who are scoring 60%. <laughs> so there's continuing poor outcomes and practice for people with more severe intellectual disabilities. And yet it's this group that are so rarely heard from and are so rarely sort of front of mind um, in the media and in the representations of people with intellectual disability. So I think we need to keep them in mind as the group who are most disadvantaged and have poorest outcomes from living in group homes. And yet we have almost, date, almost no data too about what happens to them if they move out of group homes, because it's been the people who are more able who have tended to move out. So the work that I undertook for the Equality and Safeguard Commission was to look at what does the evidence say about best practice, which was a, a challenging task because of the changes that have been happening uh, in the group home sector since the NDIS. So I conceptualized best practice as a model of three interlocking components that there's the foundation component, which is universal and relevant for everybody who's living in a group home. And that consists of direct practice from staff, direct support from staff, and the enabling organizational factors from the managing organizations. So foundational support is the responsibility of staff who work in group homes and the organizations that manage them. On top of that foundation support, there's then specialist support that's as and when required for many people who live in group homes. Um, and this is specialist interventions like behavior support planning and additional supports 
like supporting people to go um, out into the community, to participate in the community. Increasingly, people are doing that with on an individual basis rather than going to traditional day centres. But these uh, additional specialist services are being provided by staff from outside the group home, outside the group home organisation, and they tend to be the responsibility of staff or professionals who don't necessarily even work for the organisation that's running the group home. So you've got this other layer of staff coming in. And then you've got a third layer of what I've called collaboration, coordination, planning and decision support. And this is the sort of glue that holds these other components together. And the responsibility for who is doing the, that level of things is really unclear um, or nobody's got the responsibility or it's fragmented between two people. Those of you who have been around for a long time will remember before the NDIS, it was clearly the, the organisation that managed the group home that took the lead and did those sorts of things, took responsibility for all of those things, but that's no longer the case. Um, but what we do know is that these, these functions are potentially facilitated um, by the foundation organisation and the, the, the characteristics of the organisation that's running um, group homes. So if you're managing a group home and you've got really good uh, organisational enabling factors, then it's likely to help the coordination and the collaboration. But this will become clearer, hopefully, as I go through. So there isn't a lot of time to go into a lot of detail, and I'm just going to really talk about the headlines um, of what needs to be in place from a best practice model of support for people in group homes. Um, the first one, which won't be a surprise to anybody, is that staff practice of active support. The strongest evidence is about active support. If staff are using active support well, then it positively influences the quality of life of people in group homes. And it influences across a whole range of quality of life domains, not just engagement, but personal development, emotional well-being, autonomy, choice and control, uh, interpersonal relationships and social inclusion. And this is an evidence-based practice that can be learned by frontline staff without tertiary education. And it, in, it integrates um, the application of rights-based values with a range of support skills, including basic skills in communication, supporting choice, task analysis, and adjusting support to the needs of the person. And you will hear much more about active support in the second half of, of today uh, from Lincoln talking about the new active support resources. The second foundation component is staff practice that supports a healthy lifestyle and access to health care. There's a lot of literature that goes to the importance of having support for people living in group homes about exercise and diet, identifying and acting on uh, early signs of health problems, supporting communication with health professionals, acting on professionals' advice and the actions whether it's medication or further specialist appointments and following things up. So there's strong evidence about the need of these elements, but there's a big gap in terms of research and a model. There is no overarching evidence-informed model that articulates the roles of group home staff in relation to this element of good practice. There's nothing that sets out how their roles fit together, how staff should work in collaboration with external experts, or identifies the skills that group home staff need um, to fulfill these roles. And this is a major gap uh, which, which really does need to be addressed. And it's something that can relatively easily be addressed using the practice wisdom and some demonstration projects from some of the group home providers that have been working at this, but haven't really articulated and evaluated the models that they're using. The next one is around culture. There's a lot of discussion, as people will be aware, about the significance of culture, um, particularly what happens when there's a negative culture and cultures that are associated with abuse. 
But there's emerging evidence too about the impact of a positive culture, culture that is cohesive, where staff are working as one, where there's a respect for the people that they're supporting, where the practice is enabling uh, for the quality of life of people, and it's also motivating for staff. We now have a measure of group home culture, which has seven dimensions, and it's becoming clear and the data set is getting bigger to get close, get stronger associations, but there's a clear uh, connection between good active support practice, uh, strong frontline practice leadership, and a particular types of culture. Um, so what we don't know though, is having identified problems in culture, how do you change culture? So that's another gap that we need some, some work on. Staff who are competent and satisfied with their work. Being competent is, should be no surprise, but it's very clear that when staff are trained in active support and are confident in their management, that they're more likely to be doing good active support and therefore there's more likely to be um, better quality of life outcomes. There is some evidence, um, and it comes particularly from the United States, that when there is staff turnover, so when there's instability of, of staff, which is probably indicative that they're not particularly satisfied, um, that that is associated um, with, uh, with poorer quality of life. So if there's high turnover, that's an indicative of poorer quality of life. And what we found in, in certainly in our work is that when staff are trained in active support, when they're confident in staff in, in their management, and when they're satisfied with their work, they're more likely to, re to remain in their role. So keeping staff is associated with management confidence and, and good training in active support. The next one is around uh, frontline practice leadership. And again, this is one where there is the strongest evidence. Um, where frontline managerial practices reflects the five tasks of practice leadership, that positively, positively influences the quality of active support um, and the quality of life outcomes for people in group homes. And people, hopefully, many of the audience will be familiar with those five tasks of practice leadership around focusing staff attention on quality of life, um, supporting teamwork, organizing the way staff work on each shift, not just making sure they turn up, um, regularly observing and providing feedback to staff about their practice, coaching, modeling, and supervising staff. Frontline practice, managed, frontline practice leadership can be organized in lots of different ways. There's no one formula. Every organization does it differently, but the critical issues are that managers have sufficient time to do those tasks, that they're regularly present in the group home, that they know staff, they know the people that staff are supporting, and they've got their free uh, to do those tasks rather than be, trying to do them while they're on shift or being overloaded with administrative work, which we know happens in a lot of situations. The next one is around senior organisational uh, leaders who value direct practice and implement the processes uh, that are necessary to support and maintain good practice. And there's strong evidence around this too. Um, that where senior organisational leaders understand practice um, and provide overarching support for good practice, where they take action to embed staff training in active support, both theory and practical hands-on training, and where they structure frontline practice leadership so it is close to the front line, then those things have a very positive impact both on the quality of staff support and on the quality of life of people that they're supporting. Around this issue, our original research showed that paperwork didn't have much influence at all on quality of life, um, things like job descriptions and so on. Um, and there is a growing evidence in the research literature that frontline staff and managers feel that paperwork detracts from the quality of support that they're able to provide. And I think there's a lot of room for thinking about what type of paperwork, and by this obviously digital as well as hard copy paperwork, 
is, is necessary um, within a group home? And what other ways are there of conveying information? Um, does training and orientation and buddy shifts and those sorts of things actually work much better than paperwork or even handovers? Um, so I think that's a challenge for the sector. And I know there's some very different views about the value of paperwork, which I think are worth unpacking and finding some evidence about. Um, I think the design issues are, are really clear and have been around for a long time. Um, obviously, six or less people uh, in dispersed houses are, um, are the things that make most difference. You need to have staff resources that reflect the staff, the support needs of the people being supported. And there's no formula again for that. It depends on people's characteristics. Um, if you have people living together who have similar support needs, um, then that's, that's much better for good practice than if people have got very different needs. But you don't want people living together who all have similar challenge in behaviour. There is a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence about the significance of compatibility of people that live together, but there is actually almost no evidence, no research has been undertaken about compatibility, how to judge it, how to ensure and, and make decisions about compatibility. So again, that's a gap. So what's missing uh, in terms of what we know and how we might construct a best, best practice framework, what's missing is the perspectives of people with intellectual disabilities themselves. There is some literature, but not very much. And what it suggests, not surprisingly, is that people want to have control of their own life, that they want to have good relationships with their staff, that they want to have the same staff, they want staff that know them. Um, and those are the very perspectives that families talk about as well. And they're also sort of embedded in, in the aims of, of best practice. But again, the perspectives of people is an area that is really under-researched um, that we need to pay some attention to. The other thing that's missing is the collaboration with families. Again, there's very little literature um, about work with families, uh, but what, it, what there is does suggest that families want to be recognised and want to collaborate with staff in group homes. And there's some research that suggests that having a key worker um, has real benefits for that type of collaboration and that group home cultures are very important in terms of um, ensuring collaboration with family members. But there's actually almost no evidence about the practice of group home staff working collaboratively with family members of people with intellectual disabilities in group homes or the quality of life benefits that flow from this. I think we can all think of, of examples from our practice wisdom of that working really well, um, but there's probably also examples of that not working so well. And that's another gap in research that we need to look at. And I guess when we're thinking about these elements of best practice, um, many of these things will be as relevant to people living in other types of supported accommodation. So they're not just particular to group homes. So what are some of the, the new challenges um, that are arising from the way in which we're now organising group homes and from the new NDIS? So there's been an, an exponential growth of specialists or people providing additional support coming in from outside to support people that live in group homes. And it's really not clear who's taking the lead in relation to bringing all of those things together. It's very clear that foundation support and specialist interventions are in interconnected. And if you look at our training materials, you can see very clearly the connections between person-centered planning, between active support, and positive behavior support, um, and a whole range of other, um, other specialist supports. If you add those things together and then think about the impact of individualized funding, that's generating a very high need for skilled coordination between services and supports, for skilled collaboration between people providing all these supports, and skills to support people to plan what types of support they want, and for decision-making support. So somehow within 
group home services, we need managerial practices that will support people to have access to the types of specialist interventions and additional support that they need, and practices that will also support staff collaboration, service coordination, people's involvement and meaningful involvement in planning, and good support for decision making about some of those bigger issues that clearly active support um, doesn't, doesn't address. So, but there are some major gaps here in evidence. We really don't know how those things fit together and what good practice looks like. And interestingly enough, we don't know a lot about the specialist interventions and how effective they are and what works in the group home context. If you look at that, I reviewed the literature in some depth for another project around positive behavior support, and there's actually very little evidence about how well it works in the context of group homes. But there are indications that if you've got a good cohesive culture that's open to outsiders and you've got strong practice leadership within a group home, then that's likely to facilitate collaboration between internal and external staff. So to finish off, I think we need to think about obviously developing new models of housing, but we also need to focus on good support practice in those new models. And what does good support practice look like in those new models? What's different from good support practice in group homes to good support practice in newer, uh, fragmented, more individualized models? That's a challenge I think that we need to address as more people live in other options. But I think we also need to concentrate um, on implementing all the components of best practice to include the quality of life for the people here and now who are living in group homes and who are likely to be living in group homes for a considerable period of time. It would be good if everybody could move out and there was all those options available and there was the support to enable people to make decisions or experience new options, um, but it is going to take time. And in the meantime, we need to make sure that people are having the best quality of life that they can, and that means focusing on practice. We also need to pay particular attention to people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities, who are often the ones who get the poorest support, and also the people who don't have any family members or anybody on the outside to monitor the quality of support or to be able to complain. The Royal Commission's hearing heard very loud and clear that it's family members that complain on behalf of people. If you don't have strong family members, the chances are that nobody's gonna complain on your behalf. We need to start to explore, and this is both for group homes and more broadly, evidence about strategies to meet the new challenges of coordination, collaboration, planning and good support for decision-making. And hopefully um, the sector will get behind the idea that came from the own inquiry motion into developing practice standards specifically uh, for, for group homes and, and which will help to ensure the use of the evidence-based practice that is there now. We don't need to develop new practice. There's a significant amount of evidence-based practice already there. So. I'm going to stop there and take a breath and um, invite people to ask questions. So, Right, it's, it's four o'clock. Um, we might start again. Let's hope everybody's come back and had a bit of a stretch. Um, so I'm going to introduce Dr. Lincoln Humphreys, who works um, as a research fellow in the Living with Disability Research Centre. Um, and for much of his life for the last two or three years has been involved in uh, 
developing um, the refresh of the active support training materials. So he's going to talk about the background to them and then give you a preview of some of this material. So over to you, Lincoln. Thank you, Chris. So as we heard in Chris's presentation, that active support is important for the quality of life of people with intellectual disabilities, particularly for those living in group homes. So today I'm gonna to be talking about a new online training resource, which is designed for support workers to teach them the skills for active support, specifically what it is and most importantly, how to do it. So active support was developed in the UK. Um, it was, the term was coined in the 1990s, but much, some of its development occurred in the 1980s. Um, so active support training resources have been available since the late 1980s, but the two main training resources um, that have come out of the UK are from the Welsh Centre. Um, so this was training developed by Jones, Fels, Lowe and colleagues. And the other main form of active support training resources come from the Tizard Centre and the University of Kent. And this is done by Jim Mansell, Julie Beadle Brown and colleagues. So these two active support training uh, resources have some similarities, but the key difference between them is that the Welsh Centre had a um, bit more emphasis put on the development of paperwork. So this is paperwork to plan and record activities that people have been supported to do. Whereas the Tizard Centre uh, sort of moved away from paperwork and advocate for doing active support in the moment. Um, and so it's about the in the moment providing support so that people are engaged in meaningful activities because what they were finding is that when people uh, were doing the paperwork is that that's what staff were spending more of their time on as opposed to doing active support in the moment, which is contributing to people being engaged and people experiencing good quality of life. Um, another similarity between both the Wealth Centre and Tizard Centre is that to train staff it involves two components. So one is um, classroom training. So typically this would be two day classroom training with support workers and an instructor that's sort of explaining what is active support and how to do it. And then after that on-site training. So how this looks is that those who participate in the training would be uh, in their service, supporting the people they support, um, doing the active support. And there's a skilled um, observer who is observing the support, providing the support work with feedback and some coaching so that they're getting some help in implementing active support. Because the research has shown that uh, when only classroom training has been delivered and that there's no on-site training, that there's been problems with implementation. But the research has shown when both of these are combined, that implementation is much more successful. So in addition to the UK training resources is, is the Every Moment Has Potential website, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. So this was uh, a collaboration between La Trobe University and the disability organization Grain stains. So this is an Australian uh, resource for active support. Um, so this was developed drawing on the Tizard Centre training material. So uh, not using the paperwork and uh, using the four essentials of active support, which is key to that uh, approach, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, much like the other training resources, this one uh, used a lot of videos to introduce active support and to show how active support is used um, by staff to provide support. So a couple of the things which are really good about this training resource is that it was free, you know, it was online, anyone could easily access it. And it also showed support in an Australian context. So just a little bit more about the Every Moment Has Potential website. This was quite popular. It was uh, sort of put online in 2015. Um, one video, one that has the highest views, has more than 100,000 views, which is on YouTube, which is uh, pretty incredible for a training resource on active support. And then six other videos have more than 40,000 views. So uh, this resource has been used by uh, dis disability organizations to train their staff. It's been used by TAFE to sort of 
teach students and individuals accessing the website to learn about active support. Um, as a trainer at La Trobe and other trainers before me, the resource was used to provide the two-day classroom training um, and then following up again with the on-site training again, sort of those who participated trained to go into services, do the observation, feedback and coaching. Some good things about this Every Moment Has Potential on resource was that it was showing real support in practice and particularly supporting people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities. So active support was originally designed to support people with severe and profound intellectual disabilities and often they need the most support to engage in activities. And one of the really good things about it and uh, through the collaboration with Grace Danes was to show that with support, people can um, participate in meaningful activities and interactions. Though some of the things which um, probably have been realized over the years that could be sort of enhanced on was um, showing more diverse uh, range of people being supported, such as people with moderate intellectual disabilities. Um, some of the videos were quite long, some were more than nine minutes. Um, and then also another thing was that organisations who had been uh, doing active support for some time and training their staff wanted to see some more advanced skills in um, how to support people. So one of the questions that when I was delivering the training was often asked, well, how do you support a group of people doing active support? Um, some of the other things which were noticed by uh, the trainers delivering the training and organisations who had um, were delivering the training themselves was that some of the videos were not clearly signposting or making it advert when a particular act, aspect of active support was being used. So for instance, there might be a video that uh, shows that's about grade assistance and shows quite a lot of assistance uh, being used to support people. However, it wasn't clearly signposting, you know, that this is when they were using this type of assistance or similarly when um, discuss, when showing footage for another essential of active support little and often wasn't clearly identifying when and how little and often was being used. Um, so before we developed this new resource, the new active support training resource, we did it, we conducted a review of the Every Moment Has Potential uh, website. So what we did was we conducted 10 interviews with 13 participants to review how they use the Every Moment Has Potential resource to find out their overall positives and negatives about the website. And we also, during the interview, went through in-depth discussion about each module, looking at the website, looking at the videos. Um, so the people who participated in the interviews were known to the interviewers, they, or they worked in organizations that were part of the longitudinal study that we've been conducting into active support. So most of the people we interviewed were either trainers in their organizations, or they had extensive experience delivering training and active support. Um, one of the interesting things when conducting these interviews was just how much in-depth knowledge the people had about the website, about the videos. Um, they could quote lines of people, what they would say in the videos. They knew people's names of the people in the videos. They knew quite a lot of the detail. I was quite impressed by just how familiar the people who were interviewed um, were with the material. Uh, at, the, at the bottom, there's a quote from someone um, which sort of overall sums up um, the perspective about the website that Olivia, which is a pseudonym, says, I absolutely think it's useful 100%, but I do think it needs a revamp. So focusing just on what the interviewees said uh, or suggested changes could be made was that um, the material should be more or just only relevant to support workers. So this included removing some of the irrelevant sections on the website. For instance, on the landing page, there was information about how uh, the training material aligns with TAFE, which they were sort of saying was not uh, relevant to support workers. And similarly, towards the end, there was a module about organizational support, which had uh, bits of information also about practice leadership, which wasn't totally relevant to support workers. So here's another quote from Olivia who says, I think people drop off at this point. They think this is not relevant to my role as a support worker. I'm not interested in this. Another suggested change was to have less text on the web page and to use simple language. So Rodney says, I think it's real simple language, less words, really getting to the crux of what it is. 
another suggestion was that we revise the modules. So uh, for the first module to instead introduce active support and have information about what is engagement and disengagement because on the Every Moment Potential website, this was towards the end, but for people who know about active support, the concepts of engagement and disengagement are really fundamental and in introducing that earlier would probably help people's understanding. So the quote from Emma down the bottom there says, I would have put it earlier. I think it's one of those initial concepts about why we're doing this and why it's important. And I think it fits into that stuff that was back in module one about how this actually links to quality of life. I've always thought it was a bit funny towards the end. And when we delivered the active support training in the classrooms, often oh, the slides were, had introduced engagement and disengagement much earlier. So this was something to think about for the next revised version of the website. Uh, another thing was that one of the modules contained all four essentials of active support in the one module, which made it a very, very large module. So another recommendation was to split these up a bit. Um, and some more suggested changes were um, that we put a commentary on the videos, as I said before, that will explain and point out how active support is being used. So Rodney says the videos at the moment don't have a lot of talking, a lot of it is visual. So I think there's room to put a voiceover to have a commentary that actually guides you with what you're seeing. Some of the other things that were suggested that uh, be added was that show people to engage in social interactions. Um, so a lot of the, there was a bit more of a focus on the videos from the Every Moment Has Potential website of being engaged in meaningful activities. So uh, important to, or part of the definition of active support is to support people to engage in meaningful activities and social interaction. So more information about how to provide that assistance that people are interacting with others, that there'd be more in the community. As I said before, more diverse support needs so people with moderate, severe and profound. And the other thing was to show changes to how a person has been supported over time. So Emma says, you don't see anyone on a journey within the package, which I think is probably something that would be really useful to show. Other things that were suggested is that there'd be some new content. So how to keep improving, um, that there'd be stuff around reflective practice and that there also be some more advanced active support things because as I said, some of these organizations have been doing active support for a while rather than just having about the intro introducing it and the basics, what are some more advanced active support skills? So as Michael said, I think it's important to identify that it doesn't just stop. There's always room to grow, room to develop. I think that needs to perhaps be highlighted. And then Heather says, so that's like one of the biggest things I've got now. How do we support people when we're supporting three people at once? So having done that review of the uh, Every Moment Has Potential website, we took that to develop the new website, which we've called Skills for Active Support, which can be accessed online now. Um, web address is there, Every Moment's Potential. .com.au. So this training resource is designed for support workers. Um, there's eight modules. So uh, building on what we've learned from the interviews, the first one is about active support and engagement. So in introducing what is active support, introducing that very important concept of engagement. So I will show a video uh, from that or a video that explains what engagement is in a moment. Um, then the next modules focus on for essentials of active support. So they've been split up. Uh, there's a diagram there which shows the four essentials. So the first being every moment has potential, great assistance and your success. Uh, the key thing that we did differently this time around is we moved the essential of little and often to the fourth one. It seemed to just make a bit more sense logically that it be uh, introduced after uh, the other essentials. Module six, um, supporting relationships and social interaction. So much of this is fairly new content in terms of what is active support and how to do it. So there's a focus on how to create a friendly atmosphere between the worker and the person they're supporting, um, how to support uh, a person to interact with other people, whether that be at home or in the community. Um, and then the next module is one that people have been asking for for quite a while, which was supporting more than one person. So I will talk about that uh, towards the end of the presentation and I'll show a video that um, shows how to support two people at the same time to be engaged in different activities. 
And then finally, uh, the eighth module is about person-centered practices. So as Chris mentioned in her presentation, there's uh, active support can be used in conjunction with positive behavior support and person-centered planning. So it's about how these three very important person-centered practices fit together. And then finally, continuous improvement. So um, what with active support, you sort of just don't learn it and become an expert at it at the same time. You've got to keep working at it, keep developing and growing in your skills and providing active support. Um, so for the new website, we created uh, 19 new videos. So again, the videos are kind of at the core of uh, this training resource because they really show um, what active support is. But the big thing that we tried to do this time around was a big emphasis on how to do it. So proper real information, advice and strategies in terms of what, how do you actually do the four essentials? How do you actually uh, support someone in uh, to interact with other people? Um, so uh, there's two, three real main types of videos. One is a video that uh, explains or introduces the key idea um, with a voiceover that sort of in, talks about, you know, what is, for instance, uh, every moment has potential, what is great assistance. And then the next video shows a commentary of good support. So it's um, a support worker providing support to someone. And then the voiceover is picking out the key bits. So for instance, I'll show a couple of these videos, uh, for example, one of our great assistance, and it's picking out, you know, when is the support worker using different types of assistance. So the majority of this footage is of real support. So it was filmed documentary style. So if you can imagine there's a, uh, the workers are kind of doing what they do sort of every day with uh, uh, Lee from Matry sort of just filming the support just as it is unfold, no take two or anything like that. So there was a lot of footage kind of uh, for us to use and work with and uh, condense down to kind of um, show or pick out key bits of active support. And then there's two videos that have interviews with staff talking about their experiences and I'll show one of them at the end of this presentation. Uh, in addition to the videos, there's obviously text to sort of explain things, provide more information, and there's activities which are uh, designed to enhance learning reflection. So it's about sort of learning the key ideas and then reflecting on how the support worker would do that in their own service. Um, so the learning method for the website is that it can be self-directed. So the worker goes through the modules themselves. They can do it with colleagues. So for instance, a staff group, or it could be trainer delivered. So there's a trainer within an organization that's presenting it um, to uh, their staff. But again, the key thing is that, as I said at the beginning, learning this material on its own often isn't enough for it to be implemented. It needs that on-site um, training and coaching as well, feedback um, to make sure it's being uh, Im implemented well, embedded, and um, people can keep developing their skills. Okay, so I'll just pick out some key bits of um, the material from the website, key ideas, and uh, just to sort of provide a bit of a preview of some of the material. So the concept of engagement is really important to understand in terms of um, providing active support. So the purpose of active support is to enable a person with intellectual disabilities to engage in meaningful activities and social interactions. So the very sort of uh, easy definition of engagement is just, it just means doing things. So, um, that could be participating in meaningful activities on your own. So for instance, reading, um, watching TV, uh, I don't know, exercising, um, cooking, stuff like that, or it could be with other people. So it could be uh, participating in a card game, um, art class, all that sort of stuff. Uh, another type of engagement is interacting socially with others. So talking on the phone would be an example, um, talking to your housemate, talking to a neighbor, uh, went out in the, at the shops, talking to the person as you make a purchase. So there's lots of different ways that people can be engaged. So I'm gonna show a video now, which um, introduces the idea of engagement and what it's about. So as you watch this video, just think about what did the people, what did it look like when people were engaged and what were they actually doing? Uh, what did it look like when people were not engaged, which we refer to as disengagement? What were the staff doing when people were engaged and disengaged? So what, was, what are the key differences? And then finally, why being engaged in these activities 
uh, would be considered important to the people in the video. What is engagement and disengagement? Engagement is important for understanding active support. It means doing an activity or interacting with others. There are different ways to be engaged. Some examples of activities are reading a book, making a drink, swimming, watering a plant, brushing your hair. That's it. Well done, Stu. Other examples are group activities like taking part in a dance class, playing music with others, or playing cards with friends. Do you have that one? Here we go. Social interactions include listening to someone talking, waving to a neighbour, and chatting on a phone. Being engaged in meaningful activities and interactions contributes to quality of life. It's how we make and maintain friendships, participate in leisure activities that we enjoy, keep fit and healthy, and do everyday things around the house or in the community. Think about how much of your day you were engaged. Now think about how much the people you support are engaged. People with intellectual disabilities who live in group homes are engaged for about 50% of their day. This means that for the other half, they are not engaged in meaningful activities and relationships. They could be just sitting or standing, watching what others are doing, or walking back and forth. This is called disengagement. People with severe and profound intellectual disabilities are often the most disengaged. If a person spends a lot of their time disengaged, day after day, they are unlikely to experience a good quality of life and to be seen as an individual with their own interests and preferences. How can you support a person to be engaged in meaningful activities and social interactions? You can support them in ways that enables their participation. You got it? This is the purpose of active support, to provide assistance that facilitates engagement. Press the button. You can mash up when the staff key. use active support, people with intellectual disabilities can increase their engagement in meaningful activities and interactions, which enhances their quality of life. So the aim of that video is to help support workers understand what is engagement and what it looks like. So in the video, um, the people were engaged in leisure activities. So we saw people reading and swimming, uh, self-care activities. So there was an, a person brushing their hair. Uh, there was a number of household activities. So someone making a drink, someone using a drill, uh, watering plants, vacuuming and cooking. Uh, we saw people engaged in social interactions, sharing a joke, listening to someone talking, talking on a phone, as well as group activities, taking part in the dance class, playing music with others, playing cards with friends. So there's lots of ways in which people are engaged on an everyday basis. And the aim is for people to see that when it comes to being engaged, uh, a lot of people think of it as just being sort of household activities and the things that go on in the house, but there's lots of things that people can be doing. And if you think about it for yourself in your own, uh, what you do in a day, you're probably engaged in lots of things Hence, there are lots of opportunities for people to be engaged. The other thing which that video aims to do is to show what disengagement looks like. So in the video, we saw people just sitting, uh, just waiting, you know, waiting, watching what others were doing. Um, I will say that in that video, it was uh, some of the workers were purposely showing disengagement. So the workers in that weren't sort of just uh, ignoring people and all that sort of stuff. It was edited and designed to show this disengagement, but in that's what it looks like in group homes. So the question is, well, what would it be like to be disengaged, to be at that moment living in the services? And as the video said, 
that on average people are engaged for 50% of the, of the day or disengaged for 50% of the day. So the aim of once you sort of recognize what engagement looks like and disengagement looks like, that workers when they're on shift can see when someone's disengaged and think, all right, well, how else could they, what else could they be doing in this moment? And how could they be engaged in something more meaningful and purposeful? So what were the staff doing when people were engaged and disengaged? When they were disengaged, we saw that people were sitting on their own. The staff were not around. The staff were elsewhere. Often they were busy themselves doing household tasks. And this is the thing that we sort of see when we do the study into uh, the quality of group homes is that there's this real separation between staff and the people supported, um, that staff are doing for the people supported. They're, they're seeing uh, these everyday activities as their responsibility and not something to uh, involve the people they support. But when there's that shift in the video or when people are engaged, the difference is that we see staff were with the people. You know, there wasn't that gap between that sort of physical divide. They were there together providing assistance to participate and they were doing things together. So towards the end there, you see the people uh, in the kitchen together, um, pouring oil into a fry pan and all that sort of stuff. So that's one of the key differences between when people are engaged and disengaged is actually what are the staff doing? Um, so being engaged in these activities is important for the people because, well, as you saw, it gave them something interesting to do rather than them sort of being bored and waiting and not doing much. There was enjoyment. So at the end, you see the person who presses the switch, you know, there's a smile on her face. I'm sure for the um, the people using the drill, there must have been a sense of accomplishment to uh, use that. Um, the other thing of being engaged, one of the benefits for the people is that it's meeting their needs. You know, they have to uh, eat and all that sort of stuff. So by participating in the cooking, then they're meeting their needs for um, eating. Uh, the other thing is that it contributes to others. So if they're in a group home and they're being supported to cook the meal for everyone, then it contributes to the benefit of everyone. I'm sure for the person vacuuming, uh, you know, that contributed to other people as well. Um, also being engaged uh, enables people to be included. So in community, com included in uh, the community uh, with other people. And also being engaged as a way of maintaining relationships by interacting with others and keeping fit. But all these things point to being engaged contributes to people's quality of life. So engagement is kind of like the, the minute bits or the building block of quality of life. To, in order for people to um, maintain relationships, they've got to interact with people. They've got to have that engage, that social interaction. Okay, so the main, um, or one of the, the way to which staff provide active support can be broken down into the four essential elements. So the first of this is every moment has potential. So this is about recognizing that every task, activity, or interaction has opportunities to involve a person. So this is staff who work in the service, realizing that there's many moments of potential available uh, to provide assistance for a person to be engaged. And then the next one, grade assistance to ensure success. This is about providing the right type and amount of support to assist the person to engage in activity or social interaction. Uh, so this is much more of the in the moment, how do you actually provide that assistance for a person to be engaged? The third essential is maximizing choice and control. So this is about providing people with choices to um, choose what they participate in, when they participate and for how long and even for who is. Um, the idea is that by people making choices, they have control over their lives. And then the fourth essential is little and often. So this is about supporting people to try new things or realizing that for some people, they will dip in and out of activity. So if they're, um, involved in, let's say, uh, cooking or something like that, they don't have to do all of it in one hit all at the same time. It's okay for people to do a part of it, such as wash vegetables and chop, have a break, return to it later. So putting these things together, if you imagine that you're a support worker working in a service, if you're doing something, you would, the first thing of every moment is potential. You would be sort of thinking, all right, if some, recognizing if someone's disengaged, what are the moments of potential right now for this person to be engaged in something? Then you would be using choice and control, asking the person, you know, providing options in terms of things or activities that they could participate in, when, and if they choose to participate, then you'd find out 
which of the activities they want to do. Then you provide assistance, the right type and right amount for that person to successfully uh, participate in the activity or social interaction. And then as they're participating, you'd be looking at whether the person wants to have a break. Um, if they do have a break, when are they ready to turn? So the idea is that you're using these four essentials um, all the time while you're working in a service. Active support isn't sort of meant to be, you know, do lots of stuff and make time for active support as a worker, as a support worker. It's that these are sort of your way of going about working the service. It's more of a, a sort of a broader approach in terms of how to deliver support to people. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the first essential, which is every moment has potential. Um, so as I said before, what we really tried to contribute with this new resource is to help staff understand how to actually do active support, how to do the four essentials. So key to every moment has potential for is to recognize that the everyday opportunities can be used to support a person to be engaged. So that you don't have to create special activities. Um, you know, one of the dangers of uh, what, what staff used to do, particularly when I worked in services, is that you'd try and get all the tasks done really, really quickly and then create time and, you know, and then you would do something with them. The idea of every moment has potential is that as you, as the worker is doing stuff, that there are opportunities for people to participate, to be engaged. So for instance, um, if it's someone's uh, got to do their washing today, rather than the idea of get that done quickly and then we'll go and do something else, is that that's an opportunity for a person to be engaged. If uh, every morning people have to have breakfast, the idea is that that's another opportunity. So it's recognizing that there's lots of opportunities for people to be engaged. So how staff do this is to think, well, when a task needs to be done, how can I support someone to be involved? The other way to do this is noticing when someone is disengaged and thinking, what are the opportunities available for them to be engaged right now in this moment? So um, a lot of the examples are about domestic activities, but obviously uh, there's plenty of opportunities if for leisure, uh, for self-care, for social interactions at home or in the community. And so the next main strategy in terms of implementing every moment's potential is to think in steps. So what this means is to break a complex activity into simple parts. So uh, a complex activity um, might be um, doing the washing, like folding and all that sort of stuff. So it's breaking it down into smaller steps. For example, getting taking the washing from the clothesline, putting it in the basket, putting the pegs in another basket, carrying inside. So all these steps are opportunities for a person to be engaged. The idea is that when you see that every activity, every task, um, every leisure thing has comp comprises lots of steps, that each of the steps are opportunities for a person to be engaged. So I'm gonna show a video now, which has a commentary over the top and it shows staff using this first essential of every moment has potential while providing support. Here we see support worker Sam and James using the everyday activity of counting and organising money as an opportunity for James to be engaged. This is an activity that staff in some services do by themselves. You're up. So you just copy what I've wrote. Me? Program. So you just write it here. But Sam recognises that it provides an opportunity for James to be engaged. Sam breaks the activity into simpler parts and provides James with instructions. They start with James writing the name of the program on an envelope. Then they count the money and James puts it into the envelope and seals it. What does that equal? What's five and two? Epi. Five. Epi. Epi. Evan, that's right. This activity and each of its steps provides James with opportunities to be engaged. Washing the car also provides opportunities for James to be engaged. In this step, James is filling a bucket with water. Meanwhile, Robert prepares the next step by removing the lid from the detergent. Oh, 
to help the activity run smoothly. Oh, we'll go a little bit more. Reckon? James then pours the detergent into the bucket. Yeah. Oh, that'll do us. Cool. Okay. Want to give it a quick rinse? You reckon? Yeah. Here you go. Where? All over the car. We'll rinse it up first. Hosing the car and washing it also provides opportunities for James to be engaged. Notice how the support worker thought about the steps of this activity and their order. He also provided assistance for some of the steps, such as instructions to fill the bucket with water and detergent and asking James to rinse the car, but then reduces the amount of support when James is spraying the car because he can do this independently. Here we see watering plants as an opportunity for Michael to be engaged. Some of the steps of this activity are turning on the tap, filling the bucket with water, turning off the tap, carrying the bucket and watering the plants. Afterwards, mopping the water on the floor provides another opportunity for Michael to be engaged. In each of these scenarios, the support workers applied every moment has potential. By breaking down the activities into simpler parts, they provided opportunities for the person to participate, either with support or independently. So in the video, we saw the support workers using and applying every moment has potential. They did this by recognizing everyday activities that they were going to do anyway, and thinking, how can I have somebody involved in uh, what I'm doing? And then breaking the activity down into steps, creating opportunities for people to be involved. So in the first one, we see people budgeting for dancing. So breaking this activity down, writing programs on, writing onto the envelope, writing the amount of money, counting the money, putting it into the envelope. So the idea is that um, by recognizing these opportunities that people will be engaged because often things like budgeting is an activity that staff do on their own without any involvement for the people being supported. So if you imagine that in the service, what that might look like is staff in the office counting the money, writing it up and all that sort of stuff. But then the question is, well, what are the people being supported doing in the meantime? They might be disengaged or um, not doing something particularly meaningful. But as you saw in that example, for James, it became an opportunity to uh, write things down, to count money, all that sort of stuff. And in addition to that, provide an opportunity for social interaction between uh, the support worker and the person being supported. Um, so I'll move on to the next one, which is grade assistance to ensure success. So as I said before, this is really the skill of how to provide that assistance so that people are participating, they are engaged, and they do so successfully. Um, so there's different ways of providing assistance. There is asking. So all these examples are about um, supporting someone to make a cup of coffee. So there's asking, can you get the milk from the fridge? Instructing, press the switch on the kettle prompting or gesturing, such as pointing to the cupboard, get a cup, um, which could be combined with um, instructing as well, or, you know, get your cup. Demonstrating, which is showing the person, um, for example, showing the person how to hold a carton to pour milk, and then you get the person to do it. I would say that demonstrating is one of the most useful ways of providing assistance to a person to really show someone how to do something and to get, and for them to do it sort of that whole social learning theory, but it's actually one of the most underutilized uh, forms of grade assistance that we see in services, yet one of, definitely one of the most powerful. And then finally, there's guiding a person physically. So you and the person holding the kettle together to pour hot water into a cup. So another, another term for this is hand over hand assistance. So the key thing is that the type of assistance and how much of it to, pro to provide really depends on the person 
and the situation. So for instance, uh, in one situation, a person may need quite a bit of support, you know, uh, instructing, guiding, but in another one, if the person knows what they're doing, then it might just be just asking a bit of prompting, or it could be that one person requires quite a bit of assistance in, in uh, several tasks, but another person who is more skilled or got more independence than you're providing asking and instructing. So it's not that one's better than the other, it's more about what is the right type, what is the right amount for that person to successfully uh, participate and engage in that activity or social interaction. So I'm gonna show another video now, which again has commentary and features Sam and James uh, making an omelet. Okay. So now we're gonna get everything. Here we see support worker Sam provide James with different types of assistance to make an omelet. Sam instructs James to get a handful of mushrooms. So you're going to grab a handful of mushrooms. He uses prompting cut. and instructing to explain how to cut broccoli. So we just want to, you're good at cutting, so we just want to cut, I'm going to cut them here and cut them off. So however you feel mm. you can do it, mm, yeah, Tim. you feel better with me doing it. Yeah. So I'm going to come over this way with your right handed. So we're going to. James asks for cut. help and guiding is used you know as they both hold the knife. Look at that, perfect. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna cut it down the middle so it fits into here a bit better. Both of them hold the knife so that James right. can yeah. cut the broccoli. There you go, there you go. So how many eggs do we do? You remember? Three. Sam asked James how many eggs are needed to remind him to do the next step. James can crack the eggs independently, so the right support for this is standing back. This is followed by instructing that blending is the next step. Perfect. All right. Time to blend. Yeah. So let's go over to the blender. Yeah. So yeah, it's got a lot of Then in instructing how to lock the blender into yep. place. There you go. Now lock it in. Other way. Now is it on? Yep. As well as gesturing to push the buttons. So press this one. Yep. And that one. Hand over hand assistance is provided to light the burner. Notice how the support worker keeps adjusting the type and amount of assistance he provides. At times, the support worker provides assistance, sometimes he stands back and lets James do it himself, and other times he performs a step or part of it to keep the activity moving along smoothly. This support worker is skilled in judging the type and amount of assistance James needs, as well as providing it so that James participates successfully. Okay, so I really like that video. I think you hopefully agree just how skilled uh, the worker is in providing uh, great assistance to James to uh, make that omelet. So we see the worker use different types of assistance. So he 
asking how many eggs do we need, instructing, get a handful of mushrooms. And he does it very seamlessly. It's very smoothly done. Um, and he's neither providing too little or too much support. And if you think about what it was like for James to receive that support, uh, you could see that, well, he was able to participate successfully. So for each of the steps, he was able to do the thing that he had to do, for instance, um, cut the broccoli um, to turn the gas stove on. So that's active support being done really well using the different types, uh, uh, different types of assistance. Um, so, but what I've shown so far is mostly people being supported one-to-one. -one. So the question is, how can staff support a group of people to be engaged? Because often staff are supporting uh, multiple people in the same time. So it could be in a day service, they may be supporting uh, three or four people to do an art activity or um, some form of cooking activity or something like that. Or it might be in a group home where uh, one or two staff are supporting four people in the afternoon. So how do you support people um, to be engaged when they're doing either the same activity or they're doing different activities. Um, so, well, the first thing is that you still use the four essentials of active support that I've already talked about, but you also need to use some additional strategies. So the key things to do are start by supporting one person to engage in the activity. So if you imagine that it's an uh, art activity and there's three people and they're doing the same activity, you would start by having one person start the activity. And then once they've started, you would move on to the next person and support them to be engaged. And then the third person, it's much easier and much more effective to support people individually to be engaged rather than trying to get the whole group um, started at the same time. So you continue until everyone is engaged. And then the key thing is that you frequently rotate your attention around each person and provide assistance as required. So frequently rotating is a much more effective approach than just focusing on one person for five or 10 minutes or 20 minutes without paying attention to the other people. Same working in a group home. If you've got four people and they're in sort of different areas of the house, rather than spending 20, 30 minutes, just one person in the kitchen cooking and uh, not paying much attention to the others, it's best to keep rotating around. You help people get set up in the activity. They're engaged in it. They can perform a little bit more themselves. In the meantime, you go to the next person, support them to be engaged. And the other key thing is to keep thinking in steps about the each person's activity. So what are they doing now? What assistance do they need? So if it's painting, you see what they're doing, what they're up to, then you'll think, all right, what's the next steps that this person is going to be doing? And you sort of provide assistance for them to perform that step. And you will have to adjust your support for each person in the group um, because people have different support needs, which moves to the next point about positioning, which is really important to position yourself in the right place. So you might position yourself between the people supported so that you can uh, see them both quite easily. You might position yourself opposite them. Or another key strategy is to position yourself closest to the person who needs the most support. So I'm gonna quickly show another video which demonstrates uh, a worker effectively supporting two people to engage in two different activities. Please. Supporting two people together requires additional strategies than supporting one person. Watch how Ed supports Stuart and Alex. He starts by setting up the game with Stuart. Once they've started playing, Ed talks with Alex about his day. Both Ed and Alex are engaged. What do you do with Sarah? Notice where the support worker is positioned. He can easily interact with both Stuart and Alex. He can support them individually and together. Stuart and Alex can also interact with each other. Uh, what, did you, what did you do? I want to know. What did you do? Did you do um, cooking? Did you do art? Did you go for you were cooking? Excellent. What did you make? Ed frequently switches his attention between them, focusing on playing the game or talking. He also discusses topics that includes what both of them. What did you do a Did he go for a walk? Did he go, did he go oh. swimming? 
Yeah? Did you go to the spa? You went to the spa? That's awesome, Stu. That's really great. In this situation, the support worker was thinking in steps playing the game with Stuart, recognising when it's Stuart's turn and encouraging him. He was also thinking about how to start and continue the conversation. By using the strategies of supporting a group, both Stuart and Alex were frequently engaged and there was a friendly atmosphere. So I'll just sort of wrap up rather quickly. So in that video, you see Ed, the worker effectively putting into practice the four essentials and these strategies to support both Stuart and Alex, who were frequently engaged through those different activities. Um, so there's more material on the website than I've shown today. There's the remaining two essentials of active support, um, how to create a friendly atmosphere and warm relationships, how to support people in social interactions, uh, strategies for good communication. So obviously communication is uh, quite a critical skill in active support, how it fits with other person-centered practices and, obviously, and how to continuously improve skills. Uh, I won't have time to go through all of this, but I just want to say that obviously developing a website or these videos, the graphics and everything and all the support and film and the fantastic support that we saw and the people being supported was a very big collaboration between lots of people. So I just want to say a very big thank you for all those who participated and helped us to develop this resource.